Uh, I would like to take the opportunity to say a few words about the client. Oscar Engelbert is the founder, the owner and executive director of the real estate uh, company Oscar Properties in Stockholm. He has, in collaboration with different architects, transformed former offices, uh, schools and industries into 700 very specific apartments in Stockholm, like Luma Fabriken, Katarina Skola and Kungsholms Posten. And Oscar Properties is the client for the new apartment building in Norra Djurgårdstaden. There is a client and there is also an architect. Uh, Jacques Herzog is one of the two partners, as you know, in Herzog and Demiron Architects, founded in Basel 1978, I, I read today. Uh, they received the Pritzker Prize in 2001, and they are also working as professors at ETH in Zürich. Uh, there is lots of architecture produced in the world, but very little of big importance. However, we all know there are exceptions. Among them, the architecture of Herzog and Demiron. Uh, and why do we like their projects so much? And why are they important for us? Uh, first, they always explore new ways of using materials and structures in almost any projects they do, which is really exciting. Number two, they work interdisciplinary with artistic tools and methods, and very often in collaborations with artists. Number three, they constantly investigate the basic uh, concepts of architecture, the core of architecture. Number four, they work with strong, poetic and site-specific concepts at the same time. Number five in almost every project is new in, and has some kind of curiosity involved. And finally, I would say number six. They are doing a very interesting journey, going from a simple and tectonic approach in the first years towards a more complex and abstract architecture. So very welcome, and the floor is yours. Uh, good evening. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I say this always, of course, if I go to a uh, new city. Uh, but of course, this time it's true because it's combined with a project that brings us here. A project that is um, initiated by a developer, which is... Um, not anything special today because unfortunately most of the projects are initiated by developers. But what makes it special is that it's a very young and unexperienced developer and that the project that he initiates is very daring, very um, unusual and um, is one of the of four projects that I will present that are all initiated by developers that sort of cover um, an ideal field of um, what we as architects and urbanists can take out of um, a project which is initiated by a developer as opposed to a project which is initiated by a company or a private client or the city. And today we live in a world where architecture on one hand side is very popular, you see it in glossy magazines, there are some great names that we find here and there in important uh, constellations, uh, a kind of a superstar image. And on the other hand, it's a dramatic um, loss of architecture uh, done by normal architects, by traditional architects, the gilded form of architecture has almost disappeared, which has uh, been leading to um, making the normal city, the traditional city, much poorer than it was 
in the times of the 60s or 70s at the end of modernity. So we live in a very interesting but also in a very um, special moment in history where we depend on private investors who invest in projects and try to bring those projects to um, uh, to 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 the fore in a in a way that it goes beyond a pure economic interest. Now you could say um, this is schön rederei. This is you know nice talking, but we try to find now in the four first projects I show in which way these projects can be more than just be economically interesting. They would need to trigger some public life, so they need would need to make some contribution to the city as a whole, as opposed to uh, purely privatized architecture where only limited people are um, allowed to use these buildings. Or they should go beyond the traditional or the conventional form of architecture with climatized buildings, which do not uh, involve in any particular way issues of landscape, ecology, etc., etc. Nor are they normally projects which have a strong urbanistic impact and make a contribution to what the city is and what the city has had in the past. I will therefore show one project here in Stockholm, the gas uh, holder project we are working on, then a project in Paris, a project in Beirut, and a project in Miami, all initiated by so-called developers. Then a second smaller group of two projects, which are initiated by companies, uh, one by um, the Caixa, uh, is a bank in Spain, which um, commissioned us to do a um, uh, art museum in Madrid, and Vitra, the furniture company, which commissioned us to do a showroom, museum, kind of a, a building um, in the northern part of, in the German part of, of Basel, of our hometown. And thirdly, a city project, project commissioned by a, s a city, by Hamburg, the Philharmonic um, Hall in Hamburg, which are all, let's say, exploiting uh, possible fields of commissions and the potential we can discover herein. You know, because we work in so many different places and we've done quite a few projects so far, I could grasp other projects which you may find more interesting or more, you know, projects that you like better, but I prefer to give you an insight in how we think and how we work rather than just make, uh, present you only nice images. So please understand that I try to do something that is also animating me personally um, to say something which is maybe interesting more on an intellectual way, in an intellectual way, or in a, in a way of thinking, rather than just do a coffee book table, um, coffee table um, presentations uh, with nice images, because you can find most most of the projects in uh, books, in monographs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Also, before I start, I would like to say that um, I always enjoy. Um, the discussion or a Q&A after the presentation. So we will sh for sure have some moments when I end this presentation to get some feedback from you and to answer questions, should you have any, because it's interesting uh, working in different places to understand also in which way people understand or um, perceive the projects that we are proposing. Um, of course, I start with the gas holder project here in uh, Stockholm um, because this is for sure um, something you, you haven't heard from us and you haven't really seen and I try to understand and present the project in a context of how we understand the city of Stockholm and how we understand other cities. As I said before, I will um, present something from Miami, from Beirut and from Paris. And all projects 
respond to how we perceive the site. And this is not just because we would like to be politically correct or be nice and contextual. This is not the, the idea of context. It's the idea of um, using projects as a tool for ourselves when we travel around the world to understand as perception tools how work uh, how wor the world is working and vice versa those tools respond to that world respond to the difference in the world and even if we live in a more and more globalized world our architecture is the attempt or the experiment to insist on the difference on that world on our planet i think is a very European attitude, but we strongly believe in that as the only way that we can survive as architects, that we insist on the difference as opposed on the idea of the generic, which we reject in all its facets. Stockholm is a city that we have admired always. I have been here now for the third time um, for its incredible beauty of landscape and the fact that nature and landscape is so present and is so much um, structuring the city in that it makes the city uh, be very three-dimensional, very panoramic. Whenever there is uh, buildings, especially of course iconic buildings like church towers, etc., you never see those, project, those buildings only from one side but you see them every once in a while also from the back or from the side or from the front. So it's, um, if I compare it, uh, for instance, to Paris that you will see later, which is built on axes, which is a facade city. Or a city on the Rhine River like Basel also is a city where you have a prospect, where you have a main facade and then you have a facade maybe on the street, but you never have this kind of, um, this kind of um, surrounding, this kind of uh, very um, three-dimensional city where you understand buildings through movement. This is of course also true for um, the gas holder, uh, even if it sits at the end or at the periphery compared to the center here. Maybe this is boring for you, but it's a, it's a very important and it's a very strong difference. I don't know any other city which has, to such a degree, this, um, this uh, changing aspect and which has always been forcing the architects to think all around the buildings. This is hopefully what we will see in a few years. Um, it is um, in the area of the of um, a gas holder or former gas holder industrial site um, in an area which has some very nice buildings from the end of the 19th century and early 20th century brick buildings. Some of them are listed, and the um, like those. And the project is about this area, this part, um, as part of a master plan, which is turning this whole area in a new residential area. And the attempt is not only to do a new landmark, but to do a real piece of a city, which is not monofunctional, but has other program parts, like uh, commercial parts, but also, and that's certainly uh, very exciting. Um, sorry. Um, also an art space that we plan in this um, gas holder here, which will be staying as it is, and we will try to find a way to, um, to uh, convert it into an art space, a uh, Kunsthalle type, um, which is not yet um, fully defined, but the, the idea is to um, do as an area which is outside the center 
of Stockholm a new area for people to go. So not only people who live here, but it should be a lively area that attracts people for other reasons. How did we come to such a design? What's the idea behind this? Um, the ideas are very simple and um, based on a few but very clear conceptual um, ideas. We have been given this kind of cylinder, this kind of building spot, um, which is a kind of a round cylinder, which is kind of a stupid form for a building. But we try to find a way that in somehow, somehow in a ghostly way reflects what was there before. So we accepted the round form and tried to find forms of extrusion within this volume. We tested many things as always and rejected most of them. Um, based on this idea of the cylinder, we developed ideas in which the central space could remain open, but that was of course uh, impossible, created uh, kind of impossible inhuman spaces that nobody could use. But it was clear that we wanted to do something very porous, very open, which was not just sealed off and be like an office tower, but be something that reflects individuality, individuality in the sense of individualizing the single units versus the whole, and something which would also allow for outdoor spaces, terraces or stone-like pieces that further this idea of the individual home or unit versus the big block. The cuts into the cylinder were more and more something we discovered as the most interesting potential of this cylindrical given of this volume. Whether it's a snowflake or whether it's tubes. But the V-shape kind of cuts in um, turned out to be the most promising in which which not only um, would allow for exploring in the depth the space, but also through the vertical, sorry, through the vertical um, enhancement of the form to make the building more elegant and more thin, as opposed to something which would be a solid block. In plan, after all these attempts, you can see this kind of idea of the V-shape apartment very nicely. So these these big these um, uh, partition walls would um, separate one unit from the other, whereas the lift lobby is a kind of a marketplace where the individual units are being accessed, and then every apartment, whether they are smaller or larger, are having this V-shape, which lets the landscape, which is so spectacular, this kind of panoramic view that is literally all around, as if you turn the head, penetrating deeply into the building, and not just having a facade, but have a multitude, like almost the surface of the lungs or other organs which are meant to catch as much air or other uh, media from outside. So we enhance the surface, something which is for sure offering us opportunities to organize the living spaces and the um, sleeping areas in distinct places, almost like in a in the real house which sits on the ground. So we can differen differentiate the living units in a much more interesting way than in a traditional building. So you can, from in your apartment, you have a view 
inside your apartment like into another building. So it also adds something that you normally don't have in an apartment you to give you this kind of um, um, this dimension which embraces the outside but also um, offers you more intimacy but also more um, connection. In the section you can see the ground part which has uh, different public functions, um, uh, restaurants and cafes and um, commercial uses and uh, the art space that I was um, mentioning. A possible view in the apartments. We also have a lot of um, solid walls respecting the uh, ecological um, parameters that are uh, given by law so we exceed the even the the those parameters in uh, that we try to make it a very sustainable building also in numbers we have done this is a plan from a building we've done in the 80s we've done in Basel a project where something similar has been done in an apartment with an in, th in that we do an interior courtyard which opens up to the neighbor's garden that you can look through your own apartment and thus sort of giving your apartment another dimension involving the outside into the interior of your um, unit. This is a standard house, almost social housing type with a little difference. Going back to the gas holder in the plan, you can see uh, the ground floor area and the public uses, the public functions with the art space here that truly may will make this project be very different from a traditional developer's project because all that is beyond the kind of unit that you can build and sell is very costly and is very difficult to manage and is very important to have in a city nevertheless, to make cities grow also in an interesting way and not just in a purely um, functional way or in a monofunctional way. In terms of materials, um, as you know, we are always very interested in developing materials which are you know, going well with the building and enhance the quality of the building also in a central way. Honestly, we don't know yet exactly what we are going to do, but we are thinking of something suddenly very light filled, very bright. Maybe we develop a new tile or kind of a glass tile, um, which uh, will be in line with this um, concept of um, the deep cuts and the reflection. In this um, rendering, you can see the kind of staggering uh, lines that enhance the verticality and also enhance the individuality of the different units. In Paris, we are facing a very different urban condition. It's also, I think, one of the most beautiful cities in the world, and especially Paris, the psychology of the city is amazing in that it was really made to be beautiful. It was really made, you know, this idea of the axis is very French, is the idea of something endless, endlessly connecting things, no, namely starting from the mind of the king, uh, absolutist, absolutist uh, king, to the endless. And Haussmann has um, transformed Paris in the last century in, uh, in that system of axes where only a few monuments like the Opera here or the Arc de Triomphe and other places are like jewels inserted in that grid or in that axial system. It's a totally different physiognomic, physiognomy and uh, psychology than uh, you have here in Stockholm. 
with this kind of um, this kind of facades and this kind of intersections. It's almost an obsession of beauty through perfection, through geometrical abstraction and perfection. Something I love because it's so extreme and so pure. We have worked on that city in uh, our Etia studio, um, the same studio that has also produced the, um, the comic um, on, um, on Basel that is pinned up in, the, in your lobby. We have analyzed some different other cities and we found out Paris is really built out of all these étoiles, these star-like intersections of streets, which is certainly a unique, uh, an, a unique pattern you don't find anywhere else. So the intersections and the, the radial breakthrough is, is very typical and is very specific for that city. Opera, as I mentioned before, and our project is um, sitting at the southwest end of the city, in an area where this axle system is less perfect, is almost missing, and it sits in an in an area where here where it would open up this axis and connect Paris central Paris, inside the boulevard périphérique, to the um, area outside the boulevard périphérique. It is um, opening up towards Versailles. So we position the building so that, as a gesture, it opens up this, this connection, whereas now it is blocked. So it follows a very clear pattern, urbanistic pattern that is given and will open up and sort of open up also urban energies that now are blocked through this big kind of um, area, which you may know it is the fair area where the Salon de l'Automobile um, takes place every year. So the building is, of course, very iconic, and the form is very radical and also very precise in its triangular shape. But it's also interesting that it's like a knife in uh, this kind of narrow, um, narrow side that is so different from its main facade, which is very, triang very triangular, pyramidal shape. And here it's almost like a knife that cuts or opens up this perspective that I mentioned before. As an idea for this tri uh, triangle, this uh, triangle, we, um, of course, were playing with this idea of the pyramid, but uh, as the ultimate um, kind of precision that you may introduce in a city like Paris, but also on the street pattern itself, in that we are very interested in not only the form, but in the liveliness inside such an uh, urban pattern and that we abstracted this and tried to bring in, talking about diversity and programmatic um, variety that um, you have in Paris, very lively streets, very different shops and individual entities which are making uh, an, the neighborhood very, very lively, uh, probably more than in most other cities. So from the beginning, the idea was that not only you had the vertical access to the building, to the floors, which was originally um, hotel and offices, and we originally introduced other spaces which had prog pr um, public programs. So the investor was ready to also introduce other functions. Now this has been reduced, but we maintain some of that, you know, so that the building again, like the one in Stockholm, allows for other users to use that piece, which is so prominent and which is so visible, and to make it something which is almost like this tilted up neighborhood that we, um, have been inspired by. We have 
made a proposal to visualize this idea in that um, metro would be vertical and ROR would be diagonal. So like different ways through the building. And in terms of architecture or in terms of organization on the different floor plans, we choose terrace-like um, forms, which would be um, like a rugged surface, as opposed to a plain surface where office floors would be, whereas the kind of uh, more rugged surface would be for housing, also residential um, areas or um, hotel. To come back to the beginning of this um, Paris excursion, at the end of the day, uh, the tower will be inscribed in the in the city grid, like one of these objects or la la one of these monuments, which are typical for this or that axle system or axle connection. So in some way, it's a very contemporary project, but it. Um, is also perfectly fitting in the analysis of the urban structure of Paris, which um, we believe is still very relevant and uh, very interesting. So we did not see any reason why we should oppose to this. If you think of uh, Centre Pompidou in the 60s, which I think is a great building, in some way that was a shock against Paris, but they managed to do this space in front, this kind of inclined space, which offers a public space, a new public space that now can be used in an area that was too dense. And in some way, our pyramid opens up a perspective to a neglected part of the city and is opening up we uh, new axes. We sometimes compare this to um, acupuncture, as a method in the body to connect energies. The third example for a project that was commissioned to us by a developer and not by a company or by a private client is in Beirut. Um, you, you see that I choose these examples to, to make almost shocking differences between cities and the conditions of the city. This city here is so fascinating because it's so much driven by paradoxes and, um, and, um, and impossible junctions. Um, the location on the Mediterranean is outstanding and it has a very hedonistic um, side. You know, you could believe this is like the Côte d'Azur and uh, the city is known as Paris of the East and as a lively place. But as we know, um, this is the area where we are proposing our project, which has now been revitalized after many years of war and civil war and bombing. Um, you know that um, the city has always been very cosmopolitan, has always been divided and by or characterized by a living together of Christians and Jews and Arabs of different um, um, directions, Sunnis and Shiites even. And um, in the last decades, every once in a while, the kind of um, uh, this kind of um, um, opposed political and, and ideological um, beliefs have culminated in violent uh, uprisings that have been dividing the city um, in East Beirut, which has a more Christian leftover, in West Beirut and in, uh, in, in a zone which is more and more increasingly dominated by Hezbollah. And you can see these scars in the city the area that we are being proposed to do building is here, in an area in the north of the city, here. Where other buildings have been recently built, some by Western architects, 
based on money investments, which is a mixture of um, Saudi money uh, and um, Solidaire, which is a company that is rebuilding that part here, which was especially affected by bombing in the last um, 10 years. I don't know when exactly was that last um, uh, bombing. You can see here the scarces of that conflict, which is literally creating a kind of um, um, barricades that run through the city, where also signs ideolo of ideologically driven architecture, this new mosque, which is built by Saudi money, which introduces a totally different aesthetic, in the city which was much more um, um, modestly and less iconically um, imposing the signs of the different beliefs. But now more and more you can see how these areas are being marked and stamped by a signs of difference. This is a timeline of um, the last um, bombings and conflicts. Um, when Hariri was killed, uh, that was uh, obviously not so long ago, that was in this bombing of um, the hotel area, where now the rebuilding has uh, is being taking place, and the scarces of this bombing is still visible in immediate neighborhood to our project. This is where this last bombing took place, where these scars are very evident, and where, as I showed in my first image, the, um, the proximity to this seemingly peaceful and wonderful setting near the sea is the most obvious and the most unbelievable. Also, it's very unbelievable that this coastline, which is increasingly in the hands of the Hezbollah, where um, a very um, uh, strict um, Islamist um, belief, fundamentalist belief, is taken over more and more, people are less and less using the given nature, let's say the beaches, to hang out in the sense of the Western um, uh, in the Western sense, where you use your body to enjoy nature, to go swimming on the beach. So it's a, a, a very interesting and, and very sad, somehow, um, juxtaposition of natural beauty and natural obsession to sort of social obsession to um, control the, you, the natural needs to, or, or the natural feelings towards nature, so that as a consequence also the water or the quality of the water and the quality of, um, of um, how to protect eventually the landscape is totally obsolete and this has been totally forgotten. <laughs> but nevertheless, there is a, is a strong interest in the coastline also by the Saudis, to build homes which are the highest possible standard. And most of these homes and these towers are like these, which are buildings that could be anywhere, that are sealed off, that are climate controlled, that are generic buildings, you know, that um, people use as second homes that are not very inviting and that do in no way respond to the nature, to the beauty of the nature and to the amazing climate. We have therefore accepted the commission under the condition that we can do something which is a different attitude, expresses a different attitude towards the outside, which is a building that a bit like the Stockholm Tower but on the different climatical and cultural conditions is offering opportunities to use the outside and to create a different relationship between inside the tenants and the life outside in offering platforms, terraces, staggering homes and vegetation all through the building. 
vegetation that not only makes the building nicer, but also offers garden in uh, vertical gardens. We have tested these vertical plants in other projects. You may know this project here is in Munich, where we grow plants from the bottom down, or in the Basel area, where we have used plants many times as part of the architecture, like for the roofs, or for canopies, or for even entire facades. So we know exactly what we talk about and how we can use it, and we can make it a sustainable um, element. Of course, this building is more, much more horizontally stacked as opposed to the tower in Stockholm. And it's built through slabs which are overlapping and not overlapping, leaving uh, double height or triple height spaces in between the different departments. As you can see here in the floor plan, apartments that are organizing around the central core and the terraces allowing for different outdoor opportunities which leads to sections like this one or this one and the client has accepted it and wants to build it and we will see and this is also very important. I have been asked today by a journalist whether we care about the afterlife of our projects. And yes, we do. We are very interested in understanding how people use a building and how people care for a building. Only if they use it, it only if it works, it, only if this is not just a gag, an architectural fart, this will work in the future and will not fall back on our reputation and ourselves. The same was true for um, uh, most important projects like the Tate Modern in London or Beijing National Stadium where the afterlife, after Olympics or after the opening, after the hype of the opening, every day these buildings have to prove that they live without us saying how great the building is or how we care about it. Only the response of the people um, decide about the success of a building and how the building will live in the future and whether the people will still use it. And um, this is gladly the case. Um, if you think of the National Stadium in Beijing, more than 30,000 people use the building, climb it up like the Eiffel Tower. So somehow this is even more interesting than the Olympic function it has as a stadium. So this is again, let's say, um, a discussion or a topic, very interesting topic, how architecture performs over the years and not just in the immediate uh, um, time after the opening. This is Miami, this is uh, South Beach. Again, quite a different um, context. Um, this is Lincoln Road. This is uh, uh, a kind of a shopping mall, but it's an open street. It's not an interior shopping mall. It's a quite a nice street wi which has um, even some vegetation, public green, as opposed to here, where, which is somehow uh, just a stone desert, and the beach, which is, as opposed to Beirut, very hedonistic and very playful. And um, this same street here, Lincoln Road, you can see it here. And I show this image with great pleasure because it shows the time before um, architects conquered this island and destroyed it. It was a wilderness and it was only trees. And here, Lincoln Road, which now has trees, is the only place where the trees came back, whereas where the trees are now, there are only buildings. So, so how somehow time reversed it, this original context. Um, this is um, Lincoln Road. Uh, let me see, this is Lincoln Road. 
Uh, this is Lincoln Road here. Before our intervention, the, the, our, oh, our client, the developer, bought this bank and wanted to build a garage on this piece here and connected with, uh, with his garage. This is an image of Lincoln Road, of the very nice public green it has now. And our project sits at the end of this street. And that is the bank that he bought, and this is the project that was on the table for a, just a parking garage. And he said, if you, we wanted to design this parking garage and maybe um, find something more interesting or maybe uh, do a nice facade, because we can do nice facades. And um, we said yes, but we wanted to make a radical approach in that we could design something very different. And we were convincing him, and he was very enthusiastic. He was also one of these crazy developers that fall in love with architecture, as Oscar does, hopefully. Uh, that we could convince him to double the height, almost, to go up like here. So we had to convince the people from the city. And we went in court, that was a public hearing, and we were fighting for that to get more height without getting more program, without getting more um, economic gain. So in fact, we convinced the city to be allowed to spend more money for nothing, but just to make a nicer building, which was uh, accepted. And they have understood that through introducing more floor height, between the different floors, we would make a building that is really wonderful for the cars, but of course, wonderful for the people driving up and inserting in the garage, instead of just, again, instead of a monofunctional building just for cars, to introduce a loft, shops, not only on the ground floor, but also in between, in form of a bar and other uses. So to make a place which is not a stupid, ugly, dead end, but to make something which is enjoying everything. We are not big car fans, but if there is a car, you should park it in a nice way and you should make it an enjoyable place. A bit like this image, which we like so much, I think this is in Detroit, where many public buildings, is like the other way around, there were good buildings and not, spe not enough space for cars because the people have left downtown and these buildings were just leftovers. So we said in some way we wanted to do a similar thing, so in some way reverse that process and do a place which is, as I said, a great place to go, a, a place where um, the owners can also organize parties and events, which is used a lot, not only do the, during um, um, Art Basel Miami Beach, but also in other moments of the year, because Miami has, as Beirut has, also an amazing climate, and to offer opportunities for people to go in an extraordinary place. This kind of strange arrangement of, this, of this, uh, the, the structure is the result of the movement of the cars. So we arrange the structure instead of an orthogonal structure. We arrange it in a way that you can move with the car and the structure follows that movement. So that the canopies and the different slabs, which seem to dance or to move, to shift horizontally, are being dealt with in the correct way, nevertheless leaving enough space for uh, the cars to do the movement that allows them to go all the way up. This is leftovers of a, of a party. The green and the proximity to the green, to the public green, was very important. This inserted program part. The bank, which also is a rather ugly building, but has some 
beauty of the 60s, this kind of brutalist um, building of the 60s that some of them you also have in Stockholm, which have a value. And I think it's interesting also that with a new building or with transformation as an architectural possibility, you can make an existing building also nicer or fresh it up without destroying it or without making it more beautiful in destroying its outside. We continued the green area outside, borrowing some aesthetic from uh, um, Bourle Marx. And now the building is actually almost finished. We are now finishing this top part where uh, the developer decided to move there in his garage. So I think this is an interesting example which somehow explains what I meant. This is the fourth uh, example of a um, project which is commissioned by a developer. Of course, this is a different style of developer. It's like um, I said, you, we can, as our architects, in our, let's say, the reputation that we have, we can convince the clients to do more than just the sheer investment to make something which is giving the building a longer life, a more interesting life, and for themselves to make a contribution for the city. Um, and sometimes it works. Of course, it's more obvious that you do something like this with a company which is spending some money in using a project to brand themselves or to um, um, to 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 give a perception of themselves uh, in a different way especially let's say in this case the bank Geisha which was known in the 80s and 90s to um, collect art on a very high level so they spent some of their revenues to build a great collection and they commissioned us uh, to do a building in Madrid, um, whereas they are a Catalan uh, Barcelona-based bank and they've done a building so far only in Barcelona. They wanted in Madrid to demonstrate their, their vitality and their cultural um, reputation. And we liked to do this um, project because it's somehow very subversive because the site that we were given was hidden in a most amazing place um, in the triangle between Reina so um, Thyssen Bornemisa, Reina Sofia and the Prado, the, 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 the classical triangle of high culture in Madrid, the most amazing um, cultural mile, Paseo del Prado. And we sit just in the center of this, in an area that was totally unknown, in a, in a building which was an um, electric power station, a little bit like the Tate, hidden by, from the Paseo del Prado by a garage, and um, in a building that some of it we had to leave, we had to keep it. But we could not use the spaces, it was far too small for the given program. And also, it was too small, it was too low, it was too compact, it was too not inviting. But somehow we loved it, we loved the, we loved the brick, we loved the very old-fashioned um, hermetic character, and we wanted to keep it and had the idea that we could keep it through partially destroying it. And this early sketch is somehow illustrating the central ideas, which is to somehow put something on top, maintaining the given form, and somehow lift it up. And we did not know exactly how to do this, but we knew that we had to do a lot of new program underneath and above. So somehow, in between, we had to invent something. So we decided to 
chop off the building, like with a knife, and create a space that would allow for the people to come in here, so that because everything was so tight and narrow, we wanted to give a place under the building from where you could go down in this new space, which was like, is like a facade. This plaza is like a facade for what is below, and the facade to enter into the building. And besides the lobby, two gallery floors, and on the top, the public areas, the restaurant, the bar, and administration. How did we do the top? We uh, tried again different things. Uh, you know, we're playing around like children and stupid things like these circles or spheres, like bubbles. And then we found out that um, that kind of cuts that we borrowed from the neighbor roofs could have any form. And, you know, they looked random but in fact were clearly borrowed from what was around. But they left us, they gave us the freedom to cut in wherever we wanted and wherever we needed it to organize the program on the top. So somehow it is a typical example for how we work conceptually, that it creates a form that is very, let's say, iconic or special, but is very conceptual, is not something which comes out of a mood because it would be fading as an idea because it would be too individu individualistic. We combined this idea for the rooftop with an idea for material, a material that is both um, melting into the given brick that has been added on in areas where we needed to fill up the facade something that has a certain similarity, but is a totally different material. And because it's not a normal brick, but it's a steel, a rusty steel, it can be perforated, and it can be perforated in a way that it lets daylight go inside the building without cutting out the facade, without creating a face-like facade, but something which is seemingly monolithical, so it enhances again the block, the kind of monolithic character of the whole, which we also did here. I think it's very important that we cut away the building, so somehow we weakened it, we, we destroy it, but through filling it up, the windows, at the same time we also make it more strong. We reinforce its character as a solid brick piece. At night, of course, one can understand how this perforation works of this um, rusty steel. You can also understand how this kind of radical and, and um, very uh, physical materiality works against the um, vertical garden we proposed here, and we commissioned Patrick Blanc to, um, um, to do this very nice um, carpet, which in fact replaces a possible garden in front and indicates the proximity to the Jardin Bo um, Botanique, the Botanical Garden, on the other side of the street. We tested, as always in every project, we have to build mock-ups to really understand how things work, how is the tone, what kind of surface, how much perforation. And the pattern here, of course, is found in how steel is rusting and how this process of oxidation is literally um, creating voids. So and somehow this represents what happens anyway. So again, it's not just a funny pattern that we invented, but we found it. We are innocent. And the same thing is here. Look, this is a um, metal mesh that uh, allows the sound to go through the porosity of the material and behind this mesh, which has this kind of um, um, 
uh, movement on the surface swallows the sound and works as a acoustic panels in the auditorium in the space below the plaza. Back on the street, you can see how this lifted building works and how through this cut, paradoxically, we enhance the weight. We make the building heavier through cutting it away and through filling up the windows. And of course, we enhance the feeling of the people that go under this building as a special moment, as something really that works like this is an entrance, this is how I go myself, as my human body, I go under this building, I enter the building. And I enter a new world, a different world, um, is like preparing also the people to go somewhere. So to do an entrance is remains a very important architectural topic, like in classical architecture where you've had these portals. Um, in some way, this is a contemporary way to do a portal. The way up to the lobby, the lobby room, with a view to the plaza in front, and to the botanical garden that I mentioned before. And then the main stair that brings people up to the different floors, to the gallery spaces, namely where the collection is being shown and the Kunsthalle displays um, contemporary work of artists. The second last project is also very new. It was opened this spring. This is a building that I strongly recommend you visit because I think it's interesting in different ways. I don't know whether you've been in Basel. This is um, the Rhine River. Um, the Basel is uh, sitting at the northern edge of Switzerland and the metropolitan area reaches in three countries, S the Swiss part, but it faces also the German border and the French border. So the metropolitan area is in three countries. And the project that we look at, Vitra, sits in the German side already, whereas Fondation Bayler is still on Swiss ground, so is Schaulagel in the Swiss ground, but is in a different canton. I mentioned these three projects, so these three buildings, because they have a special urbanistic role. The, traditionally, also like in Stockholm, in Basel, all the cultural institutions sit in the historic center. And Basel has amazing museums and cultural institutions of world reputation. And gladly, the Schaulager that we were involved and Fondation Bayle, which was designed by Renzo Piano, as Vitra are institutions that have uh, worldwide visibility and attracts people from all over the world. And they sit at the periphery, which is very important, and that leads back somehow to the gas holder project, because we believe it's important that you have very important cultural institutions also in other parts of a city, namely if it is about building the metropolitan city as a possible expansion of the traditional city. How do we build a city in the 21st century? We often cannot say as an architect, well, I like to do this building, but you have to build it out here and not somewhere here, where traditionally uh, wealthy people and, uh, and uh, entrepreneurs like to sit and to do their, 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 their buildings. So Schaulager, what's... Um, uh, the, the Bayler Foundation was the first one to move out and this institution now um, directed and curated by Sam Keller, who is the former director of Art Basel, is an amazing place, not only through its landscape but also through its collection. And so is Schaulager, is the building that we have done, uh, finished about five years ago and which I think you should visit whenever you have the time. This is a new type of museum, a mixture of uh, 
storage and museum and anchor rooms. It gives it organizes only one large show every year, but the, which is extremely in-depth show for one artist or two artists. I don't further explain the project, I just mention it as an urbanistic context. Now the Vitra House, that we were commissioned by Vitra, by Rolf Fehlbaum, sits in a campus which is very known through the fact that it offered opportunities to do build buildings, first buildings in Europe for many architects, namely Frank Gehry was doing his first building in Europe, uh, Vitra Museum, which still I think is one of his best buildings. Zaha Hadid did her first building at all here, and um, uh, there are a few others, um, Dada Wando, um, Alvaro Sisa, um, and now um, Katsuyo Sejima, Sana. Um, we moved away from Frank's building so that uh, it's not um, seen as a concurrence. Uh, the two buildings somehow f are the like a kind of an entrance gate to the campus. Um, the building is somehow related in that it is a showroom for their collection, but also is used as a building to organize exhibitions and joint exhibitions. So it is uh, multifunctional in some way. It's not only a window, a shop window for the company. The first sketches were, you know, sometime, sometime you forget them very soon, but in this case, the first sketches, this kind of stack of buildings turned out to be very interesting, attracted the client and seemed to work very well. In that they are, the concept is based on simplicity uh, and also offers very surprising new ways to do something which is both very simple, a very simple space that we just extrude is a normal house, a traditional house form, but through intersecting with another house, it creates chaos and it creates unexpected spaces, intersections that we could use to display furniture in a very different way, not only in this linear way, but also in other ways. So we before we started actually the design, we tested all these possible intersections and tried to um, understand the potential of it. This is comparable to the work of a researcher in a laboratory where you try to understand first what is the potential of that concept? What can we take out? What, how can we exploit it to the maximum? We then understood that in these intersection points, we also, something special happens. And we had different pieces shoot and clash into them to, to the other to see what is the result. So again, we are not the authors, like, you know, finding out through our mood what we wanted to do, but through observation through observation of the things that we have given birth to would produce and that we could select. And that we could select to create moments of intersection where vertical, um, vertical connection and way through the building would create unexpected um, hidden spaces as opposed to the open loft-like spaces inside the tubes. This connects, for instance, to uh, the treasure box where some of the collection is being stored, some of the amazing stool and chair collection of uh, Vitra, some of really early precious stuff. And other stairs that open up always new and unexpected perspectives all through, throughout the building. And together with um, the collection of Vitra and the curators that had to get used to, um, to um, the building in that they had to find out how to position the things in the, the intersecting spaces as much as in the tubes. Uh, now the result is uh, very interesting. 
in that you can see through the success of the building, it attracts thousands of people, especially also on the weekends, also children to hang out and to use that building like a, like a, experiencing a, a, a world. The building is done in concrete, and I show this construction site image to um, illustrate this idea. You could say, talking about materials, why didn't we leave it like this? Because it's very powerful and very honest. But um, first of all, to isolate it and to waterproof it uh, would have been a nightmare inside, you know, to do this inside for leaks. And also, we somehow found the exposure of concrete, the naked concrete, too powerful, too um, robust for the relative fragility of the building that we wanted to um, that we wanted to express. So we preferred it to be um, a surface that is more abstract. Also because the house form is so figurative, we wanted the surface to be more abstract, not to enhance this moment of figuration. So it's a balance between something figurative, as the house form is, and the surface which is doesn't allow really to understand what the material was. So the, there's a subtle relationship between form and surface and materials. And it's needless to say, because you can see this on these images, but you can surely even better experience is that through this simple method of intersecting these simple forms, we create in very interesting spaces, also outside, um, we um, offered these lamps to the client. These are lamps that we designed for the Beijing Stadium, National Stadium in Beijing. Underneath and between the buildings, large benches for school classes, and those tubes, which are opening up also very interesting view corridors to uh, the city of Basel and to the landscape, connecting these different directions. Because it's the, those hills are the end of Black Forest, which is ending uh, in the north of the city. And then on the other side, and fr the French side, the Vosges, which is also a very important mountain chain that ends in this, in this um, area, in this, in this Rhine Valley. So I finish with uh, this project um, that keeps us busy in Hamburg, uh, is the Philharmonic Hall that has been a lot discussed recently because of its um, um, financial problems. Um, it's an amazing project and um, it's also unbelievable how the project came together. This is again one of the first sketches that we almost literally translated into a building. Um, a friend of us that has been studying with us came to Basel and said we should um, try to help him uh, with a project uh, in the port of Hamburg. This is a storage building, an existing storage building from the 60s that should be transformed into lofts and there was a plan for a tower. A project that in, it, in, the, in, the, uh, in its character is being done in every place that is being transformed. So lofts everywhere and, you know, this kind of cool style that is so boring after a while. And he said, I'd rather propose a concert hall in that building. And we said, yes, but why don't you do it on top of it and use that for the cars and for other services? And he said, yeah, well, I mean, we can do it. And we said we could sketch something and make a model 
And this model has been so amazingly successful and beautiful in a way that in a hardcore democracy like Sweden or Switzerland and Hamburg is a very democratic city, the reaction was, because it came in the press, that the people and all the parties said we want this project and we don't want the official project that was on its way and they were looking for investors. So they said we want um, the music hall of the Kaispeicher. So it's interesting because those projects normally come top down from very rich investors or donors and then people very often hesitate and don't want to accept it. It's also a very interesting um, democratic lesson. So they want it, but now they have it, and now they have to pay for it, and obviously the figures that were given were not the right figures. But we are innocent, we are not responsible for the figures. <laughs> um, but as you can see, the building is, uh, of course, something very seductive and amazing, in its scale and also in its extraordinary combination of something old and something new. And it sits on top of this uh, colossal circle and um, offers uh, light and spectacle on a height that is very new and for Hamburg because this project sits in a new part. And we wouldn't do something like this inside the traditional city which is a bit like Stockholm, dominated by an even building height and only some clock towers are um, are peeking up and are visible outside. But this is a new part outside the traditional city in a different landscape, more open to the waterscape, more open to a totally different dimension, so that the building here will be uh, a very important anchor for this new residential and office area that is being developed at the moment. It's a huge project in Hamburg. So this is uh, the traditional city of Hamburg where this project would have been uh, a nightmare. And outside it has been easily accepted by the people. Yes, it has been wanted by the people. I think that was very important for us as a demonstration of an acceptance. Now, how could we translate this? I mean, what's the thinking behind? Of course, there is an idea of juxtaposition of, uh, we could also say, why don't we continue in brick? But very logically, we wanted the water be to be reflected in that glass and we wanted the water to be reflected <coughs> not in a flat glass facade like an office building, but we wanted the surface to be uneven, like bubbles, so that the light would be reflected in a different way. So we cut into the glass horizontally, horizontally and vertically in order to allow for different functions, because around the central Philharmonic Hall uh, there will be hotels, uh, rooms, residential uh, units and restaurants and other things. So the residential areas would offer terraces that, that have this kind of U-shape opening and the hotel rooms can have louvers for ventilation that are like um, uh, vertical slashes in the glass. And again we tested, <coughs> we tested it to see how it works, how it works in terms of this height, how the reflection would work, and how it would come together as a facade. And quite a bit can be seen already in the building, how it goes up. And how this uneven, irregular glass surface um, will work in the future. Now, how is the building organized? As I said, we have this big circle where the entrance is on the street level and <coughs> unlike a traditional opera house where you come in and you have a lobby and you go straight into the main hall, you have this kind of escalator ride that brings you all the way up to the main plaza on top of the existing building from where 
the lobby brings you into the Philharmonic Hall or in the small hall, or you have lifts that bring you up to the hotel or to the residential part. You have parking and you have other cultural programs in this brick block. The, the escalator ride starts on the ground floor and brings people up to the main floor. And we decided to design the escalator slightly bent, slightly curved, so that you would not know exactly how to go. You would not have a stair like in, a, in an airport, but it would be a trip to another place where then you would be surprised if you land here at the big window where you have a view out to the... Um, this is the escalator that is bending to this little terrace on the river here again this escalator before you turn and you have a few more stairs that bring you up on the main level which has this amazing view which is the height of the city of the traditional city from where you can see that mostly only a few um, a few clock towers are um, rising in a model you can see how this platform where you arrive would work and would offer views and this is construction pictures i m i mix now some images of the current construction site and the model shots this is a model from this same platform from where you would go the main stair up to the philharmonic hall gladly the reali the reality looks better than the models So this was this area from where you could go into that main hall or in the space between the lobby that goes up. This is this space in between here. So this layer between this body of the Philharmonic Hall and the program aside. So people have the lobby has several levels <coughs> from where you enter the main hall <coughs> and the idea of the philharmonic hall the space is of course the the main topic the main um, challenge also what kind of a philharmonic hall would we do what kind of a concert hall <coughs> to understand what we wanted to do we went back to all possible models that have been done starting with the Greek um, chorus that we like for its simplicity and straightforwardness, this kind of simple topographic carving and the central arrangement of the performers. So as opposed to a gukasten, to a box, to a shoe box, we have a central arrangement. We also liked uh, the Scala in Milano for its vertical dimension. So all these models have something very interesting. We like this kind of almost city-like um, uh, arrangement. We already liked this when we were building soccer stadiums because it's literally embracing uh, the action. We also like uh, Bayreuth for its drama and its tent-like um, structure that adds something of a festival and of course everybody admires the Philharmonic Hall of Sharon. This is perhaps still today the most interesting Philharmonic Hall and that's exactly why we what wanted not to do this because most of the architects have fallen in the trap of taking this as a model because this is not a model. This is perfection. You cannot do that better, so you should rather stay away and do something different. That's why we grabbed, or we, we sort of um, uh, grabbed other models and were digging out what was behind. 
And we went back, as I said, to these Greek and Bayreuth and other ideas to understand what we wanted. We wanted something that has something very topographic, but should be more regular and more um, uh, than these early ideas. That should also have a um, possibility to introduce the roof as an important player for the main space. So this kind of idea of the tent, of the structural lines that would span across the main hall. And we wanted to do a space that is, um, looks random and is precise at the same time, that has a certain dynamic, but in two ways. Isn't a dynamic like a whirlwind, but something that moves in different directions? And something especially that allows smaller areas, larger areas, and gives um, a, a very vertical orientation, much more than any other concert hall, uh, this kind of vertical um, vertical organization, almost, uh, as I said before in uh, the case of uh, the example of uh, the Scala, that would embrace the spectacle and the performance. And in this, we have been trained through our soccer stadiums, which we, we love so much, soccer as a sport, in that you know, you can do a stadium that re really brings the people as close as possible to the action. And we tested it also from inside out. You can see Pierre and Askan, who's a partner working on the project. Thank you for your attention. I would be happy if we could um, talk. I mean, should there be any questions? Should you be interested in in um, asking me or talking or criticizing or whatever? Uh, I would be very happy to um, to do that. Yes. How that was, how that was all uh, suspended, because it's uh, obviously floating completely. We Did have a, we have been asking Harry Potter to <laughs> do this. No, it is uh, a bit um, a big effort, honestly. Um, we have literally chopped it off um, and kept the building and uh, with steel anchors, like a frame. Uh, I mean, I could show this uh, whole process. But I think it's a good question, because we could, of course, have said, because, uh, you know, not so much has been left, because we had even to bring in new stones to close the windows, as I showed. We could also have taken down everything, build a, uh, a kind of a floor plan, and then, lift and then build the whole building. But is of course more dramatic the way it happened. You know, we literally inside. You know, we we operate from inside. We we put the frame, steel frame, and fixed it to a new course, and then removed the rest uh, underneath. And um, of course, it has also bracings, so the cantilevers uh, are working. We try to minimize, of course, the core as much as possible, so this moment of levitating is really working, because that's the key of this whole uh, thing, that when you go there, you really feel that weight. It's not just the illustration. I think that's very important in our architecture, that we don't illustrate something, but we, we, we want to face people with real things. Because the rest is, um, there's so much fake in our lives that <coughs> architecture should express something else. Otherwise, uh, we lose credibility and we lose um, 
against um, the virtual realities, which are much more refined than architecture can ever be. So I think it's a very important example of what, why this building is also a very successful building. It attracts many people and people like to hang out there. They of course love the green wall of Patrick Blanc, but I also like to experience this, this uh, kind of magic moment or seemingly magic moment. Okay, um, thank you. My name is Eric Stenberg and I'm head of department here. If, if I could ask you when you um, state your question, if you could stand up and just say your name and uh, if you have an affinity, we'll try. I, I will, I've been asked to moderate, but I'll try to assist. I'm sure Professor Herzog can handle it. Uh, this is what, okay, I'm Ulrika Carlsen. I'm the head of program at the school. Uh, I teach also in fourth or fifth year and have a practice called Servo. Anyway, um, it seems as if your architecture has developed in terms of how you, over the years, in how you relate to surface and envelope and, um, um, and how, how that is also part of an urban interface. Uh, I mean, we saw many projects today that dealt with porosity, intersections, cavities, figuration. And I wonder if you have any thoughts. I was thinking about the older projects, perhaps, that you haven't shown today. And that, I mean, the relationship between the older projects from the nine, early 90s, perhaps, uh, in, in relation to the projects you've shown today. Um, yes, we, we often asked uh, about that. Um, whenever, whatever we've done in the time we've done it was, I think, the right thing and the thing we had to do. And... Um, we cannot go back and we can only go our way and um, as I said, our work is based on, con on, s on concept. I can say why we do what we do and if I cannot say it, I also say that I cannot say it. But I think our work certainly has a certain intellectual side but um, with a very strong also idea of the centrality of uh, the physical reality as I try to explain because those terms are linked you know that the sense of the real and the seduction is very strong and um, that has stayed whether the, bu the buildings were boxes or are more sculptural or figurative honestly I don't care I'm sick of um, overly idiosyncratic, individual, individualistic forms, because everybody can do that with the computer and you see amazing things. Uh, and if you look at those things, once they are built, very often is uh, kind of disappointing. Um, and I think architecture has to prove whether it works in reality, because we have to use it every day. And if it's just an illustration of what it was meant to be, then it collapses, it falls apart, and um, that's the common denominator. Whether the buildings are now more complex or more porous or is not so important, actually. But we had to do what we did at the beginning, you know, the buildings were very simple, rigid, minimal, and we did this because nobody has done it. Nobody has done a minimal building. Minimalism as a word, we were the first to use that because it comes from art, the art world. Nobody used it and we used it as a weapon against postmodernism that we hated as young people. And we wanted as young people to be visible and to be the best and we hated all the rest. And that is, I think that's normal for young people. You have to somehow find out why you do what you do and um, you have to prove it through what you do and not through just, you know, pretending things. And so this simplicity, this radical simplicity was, um, we had to do this. And, but we never believed this was the only way. I think believing is not a good way to be in this planet, but unfortunately is what happens more and more with many people. That ideologies and, and um, you know, believing things is, of course, simpler than opening up yourself to uh, to uh, thinking and to uh, to debating. Hello. Uh, 
I'm Johan Nordstedt and I'm a student and I was thinking you mentioned it or touched upon it when you were talking about the Beirut building, um, about the further use of of the buildings. And you also mentioned the, the bird's nest in, in the same context. And I was also interested in both of these projects are in a very, they're in a, an environment or a context that's brings up ethic questions and what you're thinking about that. Um, well, you can say that um, there are countries that you don't want to become active because uh, you cannot accept the life conditions or you uh, mentioning human rights and etc. etc. Or you accept to do to work there. Um, we would certainly not work in every country, but China is a country where everybody is trading with, so we should not be overly hypocritical and say, well, we human rights and whatever, because you are given so much, much opportunity to do something there, which uh, would be stupid not to do it. If you see the success of the bird's nest, I think this uh, almost unbelievable fact that they adopted it as their <coughs> national icon is amazing because um, it works as a public culture, so it's a political project in that it's a platform for people to meet and to bait, which is highly political. I value this, this potential higher than refraining from doing something. But of course, you, one can criticize, you often debated this with journalists, but this is our attitude. I want to participate in that process, but of course I'm I understand like uh, people like Ai Weiwei who is, you know, as a Chinese fighting for more openness. But the process of opening itself as a society is inevitable in China. Otherwise the, city, uh, the, the country would not grow anymore. Economy would not grow and it co would collapse. The whole process that has now been starting. And Beirut is not comparable, but why should we not participate in a city which is um, uh, dominated by conflicts, by going there and understanding how people live together and what happens. Of course, this project is a project that is not for Iraqi refugees or is not for uh, Hezbollah, but to do something there is perhaps more interesting than do something only, let's say, in Switzerland, where I know exactly, where I also don't agree about every p political move, by the way. Hi, my, name, my name is Lena Fromm, and I work with Public Art in Stockholm. I was previously an editor at the Swedish Architecture Review. Uh, my question is, what have you found been the pros and cons uh, working with visual artists early in the creative process? Um, there are no cons in our experiences because when we have worked with artists, um, I must say that this was almost the beginning of our work uh, because all our friends, um, Basel was actually more an art city than an architecture city at the beginning now, of course, has become very known for its architecture. But um, our friends, uh, especially um, at that time, Remy Zauk, very intellectual guy, um, for me, still one of the most interesting artists, and unfortunately he passed away three years ago. Um, we learned so much from him and from other artists that um, we could not have the history that we've had without the artists. But um, you have to know how to do this. You cannot treat art like uh, aesthetic ingredient that you bring in somehow. You know, like, uh, of course you can say you do kind of a drop sculpture, you buy a nice painting and put it on the wall, that's uh, l legitimate, that's okay. But we have always done collaborations where the artist sits in the same boat, you know, we've done uh, you know, even our early study on Basel, which was called Basel eine Stadt im Werden, a city in becoming, because of its three, three, three national potential, was initiated by a critical thinking that, um, you know, that we developed between artists and ourselves. 
Um, so in these very early things, you could not say what was the contribution of the artist and of, of the architect. It was a kind of um, biotope, you know, kind of a thing. And um, now we do fewer collaborations and a bit more boring ones in the sense that, um, for instance, in the project comparable to the um, gas holder in New York, we have been encouraged to work with Anish Kapoor to do a sculpture in the entrance area. I like Anish, and, but it's more traditional way of collaboration. And um, But we are I in an ongoing process now also with artists like Andreas Gorski or Thomas Ruf who take pictures of our buildings. So it's more that our work is now part of their own production. So there are many ways and I can only say that probably it's important in a city that the art scene and the architectural scene have a natural connection or, uh, you know, a natural contact. And this, and only this, is generating um, possible collaborations. Because uh, you could not say this is the best way to do it. It's, it has to somehow work, you know, and, and it's very personal. But I think that artists today are as much in a crisis as architects and bankers and everybody else. Because uh, somehow, what is the subject today? You know, what, what? But that's perhaps another evening. <laughs> Does it work? Yes. Uh. Hello, my name is Karen Othelius, and I'm a student here. Uh, I think you make amazing uh, constructions and buildings. I just have a very practical question, and that is, um, I'm a bit afraid of heights. So the barriers are set very low in, in many of your buildings. And how do you deal with that? I must correct you, this is not true. I understand your problem because I have a vertigo. I never go up in the side, so don't worry. We have no, we have no balustrades at all. In, in the gas holder, what you thought was the parapet is the top part of the room. So the glass goes all the way down. So you have to think twice before you buy an apartment in his <laughs> tower. No, but, but to keep people away and balustrades, I like balustrades to be very high because honestly, I also have this problem. I don't think that architecture depends on this or that only, but it has to be a radical solution. And um, I think tall buildings can be amazing, but they are not the only t possibility. I think it's important that we can have a variety of things in our lives, in our cities that you... And I think in some moments of your life, or let's say as a very young person or as a very old person, maybe living in a tower is very attractive, whereas maybe there are years in between where you prefer living somewhere else or, you know, so... But living and being an arti architect with a vertigo is a very special thing. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Kalle Samuelsson. I'm a student here at school. Um, you said in the beginning that uh, you don't like or even uh, uh, despise the generic in architecture. And uh, you also said that um, um, you want your buildings to be site specific and uh, take care of local values and it seems like uh, that uh, those two ambitions are sometimes in conflict with each other so i'm just wondering how you deal with that conflict <coughs> now i said that um it's a i have to be more precise i believe that cities and the world as a whole uh, need to be specific versus what has been described as being generic. Through the process of globalization, things don't become the same more and more. It's a fact, it's not even that I want that, but we work now on a book, also in the ETIA studio in Basel, which describe the evolution of the cities in that they become more specific, but not as a romantic term, this is specific. This can also be seen as a romantic term, but in fact, specific is also a form of disease. 
of illness because it's like people when they get older they have a special way to walk you know or to have an attitude or to speak or to do things with their faces and we all know that every body has that and you can almost not avoid that and cities are a bit like that cities are very much themselves and i think it's interesting to understand that before you do a project i don't say that you need to always repeat this i'm not anecdotic and i'm not uh, what you call local value or whatever this seems to be too much based on taste and on flavor and things like i reject that but i think it's interesting to analyze the city and to understand what are the specific givens for the good and for the bad and in that our projects are accepting the specific as a condition site specific is a is an ugly term is a too general term and i also don't lie don't uh, deny the generic in the sense of the normal i like what has been called normality but normality almost doesn't exist anymore because normality was what we understood as the almost invisible everyday kind of quality of a street or of a building or of architecture and somehow we have had a lot of uh, sympathy for that but in the last years the gap has been wider bec be between the overly iconic and uh, um, uh, accepted and applauded and highlighted and the ugly on the other side and the ugly has replaced the normal the ugly in the sense that the neglected and the thing that has been done without any value without any love and emotion and passion and that's what i mean that architecture normal architecture has disappeared there are many normal buildings in stockholm from the 60s and 70s you know a lot of very interesting modern buildings that you know are not in every book of architecture as highlights but they are great buildings nevertheless and make the city very different from another one i think this honestly is even more important than the few li highlights in architecture but and this is again a paradox i cannot go back we have made a reputation we have become very visible as architects we are now commissioned to do some highlights so we have to accept it and to make it in a as good as possible way but nevertheless i very strongly um, engage myself in the city um, administrations to enhance again uh, that daily business of architecture especially for a younger generation if the younger generation isn't given a, uh, the possibility to establish themselves as architects even young small practices to do buildings even unimportant buildings then we lose something that sooner or later will affect everything in architecture so it is in fact a, um, a very wide discussion that now uh, has been triggered by your question. Is uh, two more questions okay? Yes. Okay, so one in the back and then the last one. Hello, my name is Elsa Wivstra and I'm a master's student at the school. This is a Stockholm related question. There are not too many big ar renowned architecture firms working in international firms working in Sweden in, and in Stockholm. And I wondered what were the challenges or opportunities that you, f you faced here or the attitudes from the city or the pol in politics or other actors? Here in Stockholm. Here in Stockholm. Um, so far the, the contact and the debate, the discussion was very fruitful and very professional and very open. And um, this is to do with the client that is a developer, that's why I I somehow talked about developers. This is very uh, much seen as somehow a negative term. But what is the potential of that, both for the developer as, as also for the architect? And I think this he is a very interesting 
young developer who, you know, ho hopefully develops a passion for this being a, pr a profession and not just a business. And I think that's a reason for us to come here and to try to do building because um, Stockholm is, as I said, hopefully uh, um, very credible way in a very credible way is a city which is very interesting and very beautiful and has an amazing uh, architectural heritage. And the discussion with the city authorities so far have also been very open and very good. And we have, as always, nothing to hide. It's just we talk and we see what are the po possibilities and the potential. And we live in a dem democrati democratic society. It's very different to work here than, for instance, in in Brazil or in uh, even in China or in uh, or in uh, Mexico. And uh, yeah, I mean, also that's why also a very um, selfishly I like to talk to you because for me it's very important to feel the how the people think and how interested the people are and how, how open and how critical in a, in a good way. I was, for instance, disappointed to talk in Rio, in uh, uh, Sao Paulo, which has uh, amazing heritage, but there's like a generation that lacks totally uh, the understanding of architecture. And that's, again, going back to the question before, that, um, you know, the ar culture of architecture in an architectural school and also that the business reaches the young generation, that the people remain interested and are not frustrated is is key, you know. And it's 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 not that it's not given as something that continues, but it's a very strong European tradition, a very important one, and gives all our countries in Europe a very special value. We have an amazing advantage and we all, I mean, Sweden is also a small, I mean, in terms of population, a small country like Switzerland is part of our richness, our wealth, that we have this people, you know, this kind of possibility to debate and to discuss um, architecture. My name is Rasmus Wern. I'm a writer on architecture. Uh, you've been talking about um, commissions from developers and institutions and um, uh, and from cities, uh, could you uh, explain a little bit more about the differences uh, of these different commissions and perhaps something about the, if you see some tendencies of the importance from these different clients as commissioners for architecture, if they limit this to the European context? <coughs> well, I think that <coughs> very clearly uh, developers are more and more the unique, almost the sole uh, investors in ar the field of architecture. The majority of projects come from developers. The city was a classical client, but is uh, disappearing for different reasons. Uh, lack of money, but also lack of, um, of uh, expertise and lack of credibility, because as soon as, let's say, a socialist mayor wants to build a school and makes a competition and opens up a competition, then the right-wing politician says, we can have the same school for half the money, this guy is spending too much money, and they chop off his head. That's the disadvantage of democracies. So I'm again contradict, democracies are not always good for architecture. But, I and the cities have become less I, I don't know, in Sweden, but probably is a bit like this. School buildings were a classical architectural topic in the 60s in Switzerland, so of sure, also in Sweden. Churches and all these uh, citizen-style projects, you know, were all put on the table by uh, cities, uh, city administrations, and this is less and less the case. Hamburg, now, the city is accused, and they accuse the construct con uh, con contractors, the general contractors, and they, of course, accuse us also. As an architect, you are always responsible in some way, even if in the kind of organigram you are in a different position. You are not any more responsible for everything. But in the head of the people, you're just still the generalist who is responsible for everything. 
And um, the fact that you cannot take this responsibility and this liability has also created this kind of gap and has segregated the world of architecture and the world of clients and put the investor or the developer in a position that he or she is almost the only remaining client. Companies do that, like Prada, that was a great client and still is uh, in contact for different projects because they use it for themselves. So architecture has become something for some companies to brand or innovate themselves. That's still a very interesting um, possibility. But certainly much more for established firms than for young firms, because young firms, because they don't yet have this um, this um, visibility or reputation, you know, are kept away from this, and that makes this kind of circulum uh, viciosus very uh, uh, um, very um, difficult, you know, to break through. But because developers have become so important, we have to also educate them a little bit. <laughs> In a good way, of course. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you.